call the office. Now, future spelling. This is, um, as you know, English has many irregular verbs. There's about 300 irregular verbs. If we can just do a little case study for a minute or two about irregular verbs and their spellings. These are among the most common verbs in the English language, are the irregular ones. 50% of the verbs you see when you're reading English are ir irregular verbs. Between 6,000 and 12,000 years ago, and here's my attempt at spelling ancestor, by the way. The ancestor of English was Proto-Indo-European, a language that we now call Proto-Indo-European. Uh, Past tense in that ancient language was um, formed by what is now irregular. In other words, we go back 6,000 years and all of the verbs in our ancient language were irregular, what we call irregular. So what is irregular now was regular back then. That's how they made past tense 6,000 years ago, or that's what we think. But then we started forming past tense by adding ed endings, right? And slowly, over thousands of years, the irregular became the regular, and the regular became irregular. <laughs> so, a thinking question. Why didn't all the verbs change to the regular spelling? Why do we still say, go, went, gone? Why didn't we change to make? Why didn't we change to know? And we know the answer to this question. And the way we know the answer is because Google has uh, um, uh, performed a project um, of transcribing. Uh, they're, they're in an effort to transcribe every single book into electronic form. And therefore, they can go and watch how verbs and words have changed over the years. And there's very solid evidence now that the regularization of verbs is ongoing and based on frequency. So English verbs, the irregular verbs are slowly changing to regular. And it's happening right in front of us now. For example, the word sneak. Sneak an associate professor here at the Institute of Education, and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you, and thank you very much for making it all the way out here to Taipo this morning. Uh, as you may know, this is the second in our series, uh, which we call the English You Didn't Learn in School. Some of you may have uh, attended this series of six, of six lectures last year. Um, and we have another six this year. Next week will be uh, Dr. John Trent talking about accents, and then we have a, a series of four more lectures after that. This lecture series grew uh, from a couple of years ago when we thought that there were some things uh, missing, in, uh, especially in our high school education of English. So we thought we'd, we'd see how many of these uh, ideas we could come up with. And so far, well, this year, another six ideas we have. So I hope uh, all of you feel free to uh, sign. If you haven't signed up for other lectures in the series, please feel free to do so. Uh, uh, after after this uh, lecture today. Now, as you can see, I'll be talking about spelling today. We're, uh, I'm starting out with uh, a slide showing a symbol here, and this symbol is uh, is something I'm sure you will all understand. And what I'd like to do is what I'd like to do is uh, the answering two questions in the next. Two what I would call quite difficult questions, and I was surprised as I started preparing this lecture 
how difficult these two questions are. The first question is, what is spelling? And I think all of you think, well, I know what spelling is. Spelling is just, and you could probably give a definition. But as I went about investigating this question, I, I realized it's a much deeper question than, than even I realized. The second question is, why is English spelling so difficult? And I hope you will agree with me that English spelling is difficult. And if you don't think it's difficult, well, I would think that you're probably one of a small group of people. Um, let me give you some examples just to start of words that I have had difficulties with. And you'll probably be surprised. I've made, over the years, I've, I've misspelled uh, the following words uh, regularly. I've always had a problem spelling the name Michael because I wasn't sure, okay, I, I write it in and then sometimes I was lucky enough to see the red underline in the word. Other times if I was in, say, an email program and I spelled a name and there's no, if there's no red underline, I'm thinking, is it A-E or is it E-A? How many say it's A-E? Hands up. Okay, most of you are right. But... <laughs> Another one I had problems with, uh, I caught myself spelling it wrong because it was, there was a red underline. It's this word here. And this might say, of course, it's correct spelling is like that. But I was always tempted, because we say accidentally, I was always tempted just to put T-L-Y. Another one, and I could go on and on and on actually, but I'll just do one more. Another one is this word here, and there's many, many words in English that end in A-N-T and E-N-T. And because we pronounce them exactly the same, for example, we don't say persistent, or we don't say persistent, we say persistent, where it's a reduced syllable. So I would sometimes put an A instead of an E here. So these are... There's many, many examples, and uh, I would think among all the native speakers we talk to, they would also say, yeah, English spelling is difficult. And we'll be, today we'll be looking at this in some depth. To help me I, for this lecture, I use these two books, uh, which the, the one on the left is, is written in, uh, published in 2009. Uh, does Spelling Matter, the one on the right, is published in uh, 2013. These are two excellent books. If you really want to know about reading and understand deeply, and I would say those of you who are teachers, I highly, highly recommend the book on the, right, on the left if you want to really deeply understand how reading takes place. And we will talk about uh, some of the concepts in this book uh, in a bit. And the uh, one on the right is mostly about spelling, and we'll take some ideas from that book as well. So, what I'd like to do is take the first ten minutes and talk not about spelling, but something that's completely different than spelling. And you may be a little bit surprised, or you may be thinking, why am I talking about uh, something that seems to be so removed from spelling that it doesn't seem to belong in this lecture? Well, have patience, bear with me, because I'll, I'll move towards spelling. I want you to imagine in our ancient past, before we had any oral language, so let's say we're going back hundreds of thousands of years, probably before our species, Homo sapiens. In other words, an earlier Homo species, for example, Homo erectus. And I want you to imagine we've got no oral language, and I'm going to give you a scenario. In this scenario, I want you to try and imagine what you would do. You're out hunting together with a partner in a forest. Two of you are behind a bush. You see a deer, but your partner doesn't see the deer. You need to stay quiet so the deer doesn't run away. Your partner looks at you. Remember, your partner doesn't see the deer. 
and you're hunting, what do you do? Well, can I suggest, maybe, I, I saw some of you actually gesturing, some of you going like this, some of you going like this, some of you making gestures as if there's a deer. This actually, this example comes from uh, a book there. Uh, this, uh, this PowerPoint file will be up uh, onto our website so you can have access to this if any of you are interested in following up the uh, references. I'd like to suggest that this is where symbolism first began. First began not with oral language, but with gestures. And there's a lot of speculation in the literature about this. Probably four humans began with gestures or maybe vocalizations, noises that we made. So we probably pointed. And you know, if you point, let's say if you have a dog or a cat and you point, the dog or the cat will look at your finger, right? It won't look in the direction that you're pointing. And even a baby will look at your finger at first, but the baby will catch on very quickly that this gesture means you should look in that direction. Right? So you point to the deer and make a gesture. And pointing and gesture our our first use of symbolism. And of course the connection here is spelling is just symbols, right? They're just symbols of a different nature than gestures. So symbolism and spelling are very, very closely united with each other. And so let's look at the transitions that led to uh, our, from our first gestures, our understanding of symbolism, all the way to spelling. And this is a long journey. Uh, I put up here this map, which uh, is our latest understanding of how our species uh, migrated. And what we've got is... So we start here, about 200,000 years ago, with the first Homo sapiens, and we spread around the world. So probably somewhere around, somewhere around uh, this stage here in Iraq, what is Iraq now, is where most of the Asian people here, your ancestors, turned east let's say 40,000 years ago, and my ancestors, of course, are European, they turned west at about that time. So our DNA roughly splits at that stage. But that's uh, a kind of side story to what we're talking about. Um, second transition in symbolism, uh, where symbolism becomes more abstract. And here we see about 100,000 years ago, the color, where the color red is representing some, something abstract. It could represent black. It could represent something we don't know. But that's about 100,000 years ago. Our species started to use color as a symbol of something. We don't know what that symbol was. And as we move forward, here we can see uh, discoveries of shells with holes in them, perhaps to make a necklace. And that necklace, of course, again, is an abstract. It's a gift. It's an abstract symbol of something, a visual symbol. Perhaps a man giving a necklace to a woman, a, a symbol of love. Then we move forward to becoming much more abstract. And this is a very important uh, transition because now we have, say, animals, uh, drawings of animals on cave walls, and so we're seeing certain types of strokes. Do you see where I'm going? I'm leading towards spelling. And this is a visual, a visual representation on a flat surface of a concept, an idea. So some of these 
here, here's another one, and you can see very sophisticated because we see some sort of representation. Okay, so we're getting closer and closer to spelling. We'll call this transition three. So these cave paintings are still far away from spelling, right? But they're a giant leap forward in symbolism because they can, well, what can they do? They can be conveyed over time, which is what our books do, right? They, they don't disappear as soon as we speak. As we speak, it disappears immediately, but our books remain. Uh, sophisticated techniques in shading and perspective to convey 3D movement. In other words, our symbolism is becoming more sophisticated. Uh, here is a really, really interesting cave painting because you can see here the, these dots that it is speculated these dots represent the number of deer. And if the dots representing the number of deer, what can happen is um, these dots followed by a deer could have been our first attempts at reading. So someone, say, 30, 20,000 years ago would see this and say something like eight, or let's see, there's 13 dots, 13 deer. So you can see we're moving towards looking at something, a visual symbol, and then speaking something. So this is our first connection. See, this is our evolution of reading. Uh, I put in all that. That's from uh, Dehane's book, Reading in the Brain. So our present writing systems are much more advanced, as you know. So let's just follow some further transitions. We're up to the third transition. So there's, but there's a, pr a really remarkable uniformity or similarity among our many systems of writing. The way we make strokes, the way we make shapes and circles. Chinese, Arabic, alphabet, there's a remarkable re resemblance in the way our hand moves and the way it makes shapes and strokes. And of course this reflects the human brain's nature. And we'll talk a little bit about the brain uh, in a few minutes. So here we have transition four. We can see we're getting really much more recognizable to spelling now, aren't we? Because we've got strokes and dots and here we see uh, we have some sort of tablets or stones and markings on the stones to represent something. So around 10,000 years ago when agriculture began, everything really, really changed with agriculture because then you had divisions in society. Some people were rich, some people were not rich, and you had a need for accounting. And so probably, and this is probably no surprise to you, because money drives everything, doesn't it? Well, it was money and the need for accounting that really pushed us towards needing some sort of uh, symbolic representation of our possessions. And so uh, the speculation that ownership of sheep might have been the very, very first uh, uh, or something that really drove this forward. And of course the other thing was taxes. Taxes, of course, being part of human nature for a long, long time. So you can see here ownership of a sheep. Then over, say, one or two thousand years, the sheep is represented by a stone with a mark on it. And then after a while, no more stone, just a mark on a piece of piece of wood or um, whatever is available. Uh, I don't think paper was available back then. And then you can see increasing complexity. So we're getting closer and closer to the writing that we know uh, today. And so transition five was again a very important transition. This is about 6,000 years ago where we have symbols to represent sound. So this was the very first uh, 
6,000 years ago, cuneiform script was, uh, this is in what, what's now Iraq. Let's just take a look at it. Here you can see the uh, alphabet transcribed onto these ancient symbols. So now we are getting pretty close to what we understand as writing, aren't we? And if you look very closely, something seems to be missing. Well, not really, but you notice that there's only uh, two, two or three vowels. So most of that the spelling back then was consonants as opposed to vowels. And of course, you're all familiar with seeing uh, this, this kind of thing independently, which is interesting, isn't it? Independently. And this word independent is very important because what we will learn, or what I learned by doing this research, is that um, these systems independently were aligned with our languages. So our alphabets or our, our, our writing systems have become aligned with the way we speak and our grammar, but mostly our phonology, the, the sounds that we make. Then we have a different uh, in transition six, because it's nothing to do with spelling itself, as all these other transitions we've seen are transitions in symbols, 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 symbols becoming more sophisticated. But in this transition, does anybody know who this is? This is a guy named Gutenberg. And Gutenberg, uh, none of us would be here today, almost for sure, if it weren't for Gutenberg. But of course, if it wasn't Gutenberg, it would have been someone else, probably a few <laughs> years later. So he was just the first. So Gutenberg came up with this brilliant idea of movable type. And so, before Gutenberg, everything was written by hand. And then he came up with the idea of making a printing press. So he was the first one. And of course, because everything was written by hand, books were expensive and rare. And because books were expensive and rare, <coughs> literacy was also very low. So the result of Gutenberg's printing press, there you can see a, a, a graphic of it, uh, books were no longer expensive and rare. Books became widely available, and literacy expanded. And here's the key point. Spelling needed to be regularized. So all human activities, and I'll give you another example of this in a few minutes, but all human activities, we try to standardize things, we try to regularize things. So, we needed a standard way to spell, because books were moving up. We couldn't have some people using some spellings and other people using other spellings. And of course, it's speculated that the printing press and the expanded literacy led to the Renaissance scientific revolution, and that's why we've got all this wonderful technology that we've got today. So just uh, putting things in perspective, uh, from 200,000 years ago when our species first emerged in uh, southern and eastern Africa, let's just summarize what I've just explained. So first of all, sometime in our ancient past, it was probably not with our species. Probably, because as you know, animals have symbolism too. Like a monkey will give different kind of noises to represent different kinds of dangers or different kinds of food sources and so forth. So symbolism goes back a long, long way before our species. But, um, Pointing is a little bit more sophisticated, and then we go and get into colors, we get into cave paintings, we get pictures and strokes and so forth representing numbers and ideas, then symbols representing sounds, phonetic, in other words, the 6,000 years ago. And 
then books become widespread about 600, 500, 600 years ago. So you can see this is sort of the, the whole transition. And we are moving faster and faster, of course, uh, today with the internet. And a need for regularized spelling arose. And so we're getting kind of closer to our second question, aren't we? Why is English spelling so difficult? But we haven't even started to answer that question. So, what is spelling? That's our first question. Spelling is the visual representation of a word or words with letters. It's a very simple definition. Spelling attempts to transcribe the sounds of the language into... So that's the reason why uh, if you're, let's say you're not Chinese, and someone says to you, uh, can you imagine someone saying to you, what, how do you spell, for example, China in Chinese? We wouldn't ask that question, would, would we? We wouldn't say, how do you spell? You'd say, how do you write? You'd say, how do you write? So somehow spelling is associated with the type of characters that have a direct representation to the sound. And, and, and as you know, Chinese characters also do. There's several hundred uh, phonetic uh, radicals that you use in Chinese to spell. But you don't use that, that term, spell. So it's sort of confined to alphabetic type um, uh, writing. So here's an early example from about 1400. So this is just before Gutenberg. So you can see when you're looking, this is English. And don't ask me to, to read that to you because of course I can't. I think I can read Chinese better than I can read that. <laughs> so um, let's just take a little uh, longer look at Chaucer. Chaucer is one of the, the most famous uh, authors from that era. So let's look at some examples. We won't spend long on this because I know it's, it's, it's not all that interesting. But let's take a look. I'll put down what Chaucer wrote and then the modern version is here. So we can see a lot of similarity, but also a lot of differences. Let's just take a look at the words in red, red color font. So we can see something has happened. Over 600 years, the spelling has changed. So liqueur becomes liquid. You can see they're similar, but the spelling is definitely different. And I'm just isolating one word, a sentence, but there's other words there that you can see are exactly the same. Other words are quite different. Now here's an interesting one because both of those words are in modern English but a little bit different spelling. There's another example. So what I want to do here is uh, take a diversion and uh, talk about why standardization is so important. And you can see here, uh, we're not talking about spelling now, we're talking about measurement. And you can see here that uh, there's uh, a, both systems I think you're familiar with, yeah? The, what do we call this, the, the uh, imperial system? What's this called? And this here, of course, is the metric system. You can see how much better the metric system is, can't you? Because everything is standardized. And another, if we take a look around the world, which countries are using the metric system compared to the countries that are using the old imperial system? There you go there. So the reason why I'm uh, taking this diversion uh, is to just uh, emphasize or highlight how important standardization is for the human brain. We really want things to be in a standard way where everyone recognizes the same system. And somehow, well, the United States is somehow 
um, uh, not been able to change to the metric system, but the rest of the world has. But if we go back to the previous slide, we can see the metric system is simply better. And this is why we've standardized. So what's this got to do with spelling? Well, it's because there is, there is a need, especially with the internet or especially with books 500 years ago, to have some sort of standard system that everybody can use. Now, I just want to go in a little bit different direction now and talk a little bit about spelling and, and society today. We often associate good spelling with high intelligence, and, and I'm sure all of you are the same. When you see a spelling mistake, it sort of jumps out at you, and you are thinking, well, who wrote this? And especially if it's on your resume, your CV. You make a spelling mistake, and you are the employer. You see a spelling mistake, sometimes the boss just throws out the resume with, with a simple spelling mistake. I mean, if you've got 100 resumes, and one of them has a spelling mistake on it, you throw it out. But it's a little bit unfair, isn't it? Because just because you have a very good memory and you can spell very well, doesn't mean you are especially intelligent. So bad spelling, like it or not, bad spelling. On that note, we're going to do a little bit of an interactive task. <laughs> so, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. Well, there's eight sentences here. I want you to tell me which words are spelled wrong. Okay, you can talk about it. Okay, the way we'll do this is, I'll say the number, if you think it's spelled wrong, you put up your hand. Number one. Number two. Number three. Oh, you're so smart. <laughs> number four. Number five. Number six. Number seven. Number eight. Okay, let's take a look. Occasion. And as we're going through these, I want you to try to analyze because I'm showing you stereotypical mistakes, misspellings. And I want you to try and analyze. What are the patterns of mistakes or errors? Accommodation, two M's. I spelt this wrong for years before there was a red line checker. <laughs> of course, received. This is the classic end. This is a very difficult word to misspell if you're using a word processor because Microsoft Word has built in a program. If you spell it wrong and then you press spacebar, it co automatically corrects it for you, unless you have turned off automatic spell check. 
Separate is another word that is automatically corrected. Okay, I was le being a little bit naughty here. <laughs> Tell the truth. How many of you caught misspelled or spelled wrong? Hands up. Not one person. And I even said in the sentence, it's definitely misspelled. <laughs> okay, it's important. The calendar. Okay, what's the pattern? There's a couple, there's two patterns here of common. Most common spelling mistakes are. Anybody? Vowels. Vowels. Usually vowels in unstressed syllables. Because vowels in unstressed syllables always uh, revert to schwa, a, a sound. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples later of this. And of course, the other pattern is double double letters. This is where we often uh, make mistakes. And then, in some cases, you have American spelling and British spelling. For example, traveling or traveler. American American spelling only one L. British spelling two Ls. Um, let's uh, at common misspellings. So on the uh, left side is the correct spelling, on the right side is the correct spelling. And you can see we're, we're just down to A and B, so we could, we could go through these for the next half an hour. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that this site exists. If some of you do have problems with your spelling, uh, there's two, two uh, strategies you can take. One is you can go to this link. Strategy. Another strategy is to get spelling and use the red line spell check. So why is English spelling so difficult? This is our second question, and this question is more well, at least equally difficult uh, with the first question. It's interesting if we were in Italy, Finland. Spain, we would not be having this lecture, or the lecture would end at this point. Okay. You know, the first part about the symbols is interesting, uh, but there'd be nothing to talk about. Because in Finnish, Italian, Spanish, even German, well, not German so much, but at least better than English, uh, they don't make spelling mistakes. Japanese, they don't make spelling mistakes. They make Chinese character mistakes. Don't misunderstand me. Japan. We'll do a little case study on Japanese in a minute to just try and illustrate the importance of the sound spelling connection. But these languages map letters. The word map here is a verb. I think it's a transcribe or map letters onto sounds in a trans. English does not. And so what we're going to do for the next few minutes is try and explain why this has happened and try and understand the, the hidden logic behind why English is so difficult to spell. So I'm going to give you four reasons why English spelling is difficult. The first reason is English has more, many more vowel and consonant sounds than there are letters in the alphabet. Why does it have more sounds? Well, that's, that's for a different lecture. This goes back to the history of English. But for the time being, let's just recognize that English has many, many sounds. Uh, these other languages like Italian or Spanish or Finnish have fewer sounds. Second reason. Many English words come from other languages and retain their original spelling. Uh, 
Dr. Tim Taylor in uh, lecture four will be talking about words and their origins and so I won't be going into that so much but I'll give you one or two examples but I'm sure most of you know for example every word in the English language that ends with T-I-O-N is a French word it comes from French or if it ends in Q-U-E it comes from like Czech it comes from English has many, many words from French. It has many, many... I'm, I'll give you a couple more examples. Three, homophones. Homophones are words that sound the same but have different meaning. For example, you can see there the, the, the two words sail and sail. Okay? They're spelled differently. Homophones need to be distinguished from each other. For English is pronounced very differently according to where one comes from, but one standard spelling is needed. Okay, so those are four of the main reasons. There's a couple more reasons we'll also look at. So let's look at each of these reasons in some detail. So here, why is English spelling difficult? Many different sounds in English. So English has 11 or 12 vowel sounds. The reason why I say 11 or 12 is because some dialects or some um, versions of English uh, have different number of vowel sounds than others. But we've only got five letters. So how do we represent those? or 12 sounds with only five letters. That's a problem. And what I've put up here is this uh, vowel box that you can see. That when it says front, that just means your tongue is in the front part of your mouth. So when you say the sound, for example, E, your tongue is forward and not the front. Whereas when you say uh, this sound here, ah, So, uh, a good example of this 11 or 12 is the fact that in my dialect, this sound here, I don't have this sound. So when I say the word law, I say it the same as father, ah, uh, fa, law. It's exactly the same. Whereas many people in Hong Kong will say father, same as me, but you will probably round your lips, make your lips a little bit round when you say law. Probably most of you have a different, uh, my, my accent comes from Canada and it's generally called standard American English. So my accent is very similar to an American accent, almost exactly the same. So uh, the point here is that we've got five, le five letters and we've got 11 or 12 sounds. And then if we combine vowels, for example, the word boy, or we, that's two together, then it grows up to about 19 different vowel sounds. Oi, boy, or um, uh, loud, uh, ow. So that's another one. So we have, these are called diphthongs, when two vowels uh, are together. Then we've got 24 consonant sounds, but only 20 letters. So English has a problem in using the alphabet, because the alphabet is not completely suitable for English, but we are stuck with the alphabet because of historical reasons, and I will explain those historical reasons. So here we have the vowel sounds and the consonant sounds in English. There's a lot of sounds in English, and this is what uh, makes uh, pronunciation for non-native. Just for example, all of you know the TH sound. You do not have this sound in Chinese, therefore it's a challenge for you to, to produce this sound because it doesn't come naturally to you. So let's do a little case comparison with Japanese. And the reason why I'm doing this is because Japanese, uh, 
uh, created what's called uh, syllabary. It's not really an alphabet because it's uh, symbols to represent syllables, especially for their own language. So it's perfect for their own language. Um, let's uh, skip this because I'll show you uh, some examples. It's got 46 characters, so not so many. Each character represents one of the sounds in Japanese, one character for one sound. It's actually a syllabary, which means it's ka ki ku ke ko sa shi su se so. It's like that, so it includes consonant and a vowel. So we're going to do a mini Japanese lesson. Is that <laughs> Let's just do it. Let's read together. Ma, ku, do, na. Now this one here, oops. this one here is difficult because it's a sound you don't have in in Chinese, or we don't have it in English. But it's like a da, 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 like a soft d. So do. Do, do, do. Maku do naru do. And if you say it really fast, you've got maku do naru do. Now let's do this one. Ha, m, ba, ga. Hamba. So this is a, a language, they've created a system in their language. They've created symbols to perfectly map onto the way Japanese makes sounds. Uh, this alphabet, this, this is called katakana, and katakana is only for words that come from other languages. See, they're smart in Japan. They have a for words that come from other languages, but in English we don't do that. We just take the spelling, and that makes English difficult, spelling difficult. Now if we, in case you were thinking Japanese is easy, they have three systems. One of them, as you can see here, is what they call Chinese, well, you know, Chinese characters here. So this is Nihon, but it's got no phonetic you, you have to memorize it. There's no, because as you know, Chinese characters, you have to memorize them. And so we see katakana here. This word here actually is uebusaito. Got it? Uebusaito, website. website. And the, the green ones are for Japanese words that they use phonetically. So this one here is like a subject marker. This is an honorific. Honorific means to be polite to something. And this one here is like a preposition. Uh, prepositions and markers. So uh, three different. So Japanese is not at all easy. But, <laughs> but the point I'm making is here you have a language that has created a writing system that perfectly fits their language. Uh, if I knew Korean, if I knew any Korean, I would do the same for Korean because Korean is, is clearly the best in the world at this. They've, they've created a system that's perfect. You can see Japanese system is not perfect because it's got Chinese characters all throughout, which makes things really, really difficult. So English can adapt, or the alphabet, I should say, can adapt Japanese words. So for example, the, because Japanese only has five vowel sounds, the alphabet is actually pretty good at adapting for uh, Jap Japanese. And Japanese doesn't have very many consonants, so the alphabet is also pretty good for speaking, uh, for writing Japanese. So if we take a look here, if you say this, if you saw this word for the first time, 
And you said it to a Japanese person, and you said, Sayonara. Well, the R sound is diff different in Japanese. Uh, sayon sayonara. Da, da. So it's a little bit different. But a Japanese person would be perfectly able to understand. Konnichiwa. A Japanese person could perfectly the alphabet is really quite good for a good system for the Japan for Japanese. It's not perfect. There's some other things that don't work as well. But Chinese is another story. And we'll talk a little bit about Chinese in a minute. But a very quick comparison here. What I'd like to do is look at Italian very quickly. And let's go to um, this one here. These are the rules in Italian. How to pronounce Italian vowels. Take a look. It's like a joke. You can start pronouncing Italian immediately. That's it. That's all you have to learn. Five rules. It's unbelievable. If we did this for English, we would, we would need a flash memory to, to record all of the different rules and exceptions. Italian, just five rules. Just for an English speaker, that's it's almost unbelievable. Whoops, what happened? Last time. Sorry, sorry about this. So, Japanese and Italian. In both languages, the writing system maps transparently onto the pronunciation. Children learn to read much faster than English-speaking children. And as you know, Chinese-speaking children are probably the slowest to learn to read because, because you have such a difficult system. But I hope you're starting to think, why is Chinese so difficult? Why doesn't Chinese switch to the alphabet? Because we're going to answer that question. <laughs> so that's another story as far as Chinese is concerned. So. And dyslexia. I hope I've got the correct translation of dyslexia, do I? Dyslexia is a disorder, a reading disorder, where uh, children have a, take a long time to learn to read. Uh, I'd really like to, to go into detail here, but again, we need another lecture for this. <laughs> so why is English spelling so difficult? Many different sounds in English. So English has 11 or 12 vowel sounds and 24 consonant sounds, but there's only 26 letters. That's a problem. And two of those letters are pretty useless, aren't they? Q is a useless letter. And X, which sounds like X, is another useless letter. We don't even need them. So let's go on to our second reason. English borrows many words from other languages. I'm going to teach you a new word. I'm almost sure nobody knows this word, but it's a very, very useful word. And so words from other languages may be adopted without being adapted to the spelling system. So we take the word from another language and we keep the spelling. But the spelling is sometimes difficult. Let's take a look. Do you know this word? This is nuts. It's come into English several decades ago. But I see it more and more and more. And it's because it's such a useful word. But in English, we have no word for it. And I'm going to show you a graphic. Can you understand? Can you understand what this graphic? Here's the Chinese translation. For those of you who cannot read Chinese and don't know the meaning of schadenfreude, 
schadenfreude means to, to secretly another person's misfortune. <laughs> And I'm sure all of you have experienced this. <laughs> but notice, notice that uh, the S-C-H there, normally in English we wouldn't put a C, right, for a sh sound. We just say shadow, shadow. So, this is um, just one of thousands of examples where words have come into. Do you know this? Do you know the word promiscuous? Promiscuous refers to. Well, I won't go into it. You can look it up in the dictionary. From, uh, but it, what it means is easy to take on. Easy to take on. English is a very promiscuous language. Uh, we very easily borrow words from other languages. The third, the third point, the need to distinguish homophones. Spelling helps us distinguish word meanings. Two, two, two. So two is a very, very common sound in English, isn't it? It's a preposition, it's a number, it's, uh, what's two? T-O-O was that matter. Um, so our ancestors recognized, when I say our ancestors, I should say my ancestors, recognized that there were too many of this two sound in English. So therefore we needed some way to distinguish it. So somewhere around six or seven hundred years ago, they said, we better start to distinguish these different twos by giving them different spelling. Or else, if it's always T-O, people might get confused. So this is a gift from our ancestors to help us distinguish be between this two sound. Now, it's a gift for me but it's not a gift for many non-native speakers because you have to, it's more difficult to, to uh, memorize these different spellings. Another example is I and I, or Q, 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 Q. So um, non-standard spellings are often adopted and different, for example, T, W, O, that was adopted. Change came about. Their homophones may be deliberately spelled in different ways to differentiate them visually from each other. The development of an accepted standard of spelling is natural, and all languages tend to do this, at least that use the alphabet. So, for example, there's, there's another example sale and sale. Okay? And I went to the website and just put in homophones and clicked on images and this is one of the ones that came up. So English has many, many examples of this as all of you know and have struggled with, I'm sure. But is anybody thinking something right now? Someone thinking, yes, but. There's so many exceptions to this. For example, Look at these words. Check, book, fat, glass, fire, seal. All of them have two meanings. I'll give you a minute to think about what is the two meanings of each of those words. What's the pattern? What's the pattern? Why did these words not get changed? Why didn't our ancestors change the spelling of these words? Anybody have the answer? 
because they're um, in some cases maybe in some cases maybe. I was thinking of something different. What? Sorry. Yeah. I think so. I think so. All of these can be like a check. Uh, can you, uh, if we use it in a sentence, for example, as a verb, can you check something or a check as a check? Book can be something you read or you can also book a table at a restaurant. So all of these, except for glass, as you can see, glass is a noun, right? We can't make that into a verb, but most uh -huh. of them... Yes, you can. Glass is being used in Australia as a verb. Glass people who break glass in a pub and then attack them with broken glass. <laughs> <laughs> I learned something new. <laughs> okay, but... The point being, just in general, our ancestors decided to change the words where there could be some confusion. They changed the spelling. In, this, in the case of these, they figured, okay, we don't need to change it because they are different parts of speech. One's a noun, one's a verb, so we don't need to change it. Of course, this is just a theory. We cannot say for sure. Anyway, there's many, many, many more exceptions like this that we could we could uh, look at. The fourth, we have to think of whose, whose accent should we follow in our spelling. Remember our question again is why is English spelling so difficult? Should we follow uh, a British accent? Should we follow an American accent? And let me give you some examples, okay? I'm going to show you some images. I want you to look at the image and immediately say the word. Ready? So, we could have two different pronunciations. We could have dance, or we could have dance. So, which vowel do we use to represent those two sounds? It's not now, what I was hearing most of you saying, <laughs> saying after you made a mistake, it's a cheese. What I heard most of you saying was butter. You said you said it with a t -t. whereas when I say this, when I when I, if I'm just talking naturally, I would say butter, butter. So I would use a, what's called a flap. R, not quite a D, but not quite a T. It's called a flap R. So I would I would say butter. So my accent, I use a D, a D sound. Your accent, for most of you, I think you are using a T, t uh, a voiceless. Um, what's? I don't want to get into the techniques of technical language, but you would use a T sound. Okay, another one. This word here. How do you pronounce this word? Okay, I want to really hear what you're saying. So, um, I'm going to go one, two, three, and then you say the word, okay? One, two, three. Because um, I've often heard in Hong Kong people say, mandatory. Uh, no, our former president here, <laughs> who is now uh, famous for another reason. Uh, um, you listen to him say, and he'll say mandatory. And this is something I just, I didn't even understand him the first time he said it. What's this word, new word? Um, if we click here on Oxford, and uh, I think this is an American one, uh, they both pronounce it... Uh, Mandatory. The point, anyway, the point is different accents, different pronunciation. What spelling do we use? So we, again, we have to have a standardized spelling. How about this one? 
is not a rock. <laughs> it's a word starting with M. It can be pronounced missile, or it can be pronounced missile. Very, very different pronunciations. And I want you to remember one more thing. The word is pronunciation. It is not pronunciation. Pronounce is a verb. Pronunciation is a noun. So don't say pronunciation unless you want to sound uneducated. <laughs> so let's just go over them again. A summary. English has many more vowel and consonant sounds than letters in the alphabet. Many English words come from other languages and retain their original spelling. Homophones need to be distinguished from each other. And English is pronounced very differently according to where one comes from, but one standard spelling is needed. Okay? So can we can we do something with English to remove all of these problems? Well, they've actually tried to do this, so let's follow this through, okay? We've got a five-year plan for changing English spelling, okay? In the first year, we remove the soft and hard C, okay, like city and cat. Why are both of the C's pronounced differently? In the first year, S will be used instead of the soft C. Certainly, civil servants will receive this news with joy. Also, the hard C will be replaced with K. Not only will this clear up confusion, but typewriters can have one less letter. Okay? Makes sense, right? Okay, let's continue this thought experiment. Second year, replace PH by F. That makes sense, doesn't it? There will be growing public enthusiasm in the second year when the troublesome PH will be replaced by F. This will make words like photograph 20% shorter. <laughs> Third year, remove the double letters. In the third year, public acceptance of the new spelling can be expected to reach the stage where more complicated changes are possible. Governments will encourage the removal of double letters, which have always been a deterrent to accurate spelling. Also, all will agree that the horrible mess of silent E's in the language is Fours and fives. <laughs> Replace TH by, and W by Z or Z and V. receptive to steps such as replacing TH by Z and W by B. During the vids year, the unnecessary O can be dropped from words containing OU, and similar changes would, of course, be applied to other combinations. Okay, final year. After this fifth year, we will have a really sensible written style. There will be no more troubles or difficulties, and everyone will find it easy to understand each other. <laughs> the dream will finally come true. So, okay, let's get serious again. <laughs> so could there be some hidden logic? Some spellings help with meaning and pronunciation. For example, if you look at this word insane, and 
it sounds like it's sane. And then we go to the now, insanity. Would it make any sense at all for us to change the vowel sound in one of these words? So what we need in English is something to, across different word, sets of words with the same root, we have to keep the same spelling. If we don't keep the same spelling, then a word like insanity or insane, we would use a different vowel sound and we would lose the sense of understanding when we're reading. I'll give you some other examples. Column has a silent N on the end. You say, why is there this N there? It doesn't help us at all, does it? But then, if you look at columnist, columnist. So the N is actually helping us when we change the uh, inflection here. Christ. Can you think of an example where Christmas or Christian? So do we want to change the vowel sound there in one of the two words? Then we'd sort of lose the sense of the, 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 mean, the meaning would get lost as we're looking at it. Another example, photo, photographer, photo, photographer. So the, in the first one, we pronounce it O. In the second one, we pronounce it O, F, F, photographer. But if we change that to another symbol, another letter, it would, it would lose the visual sense that, we're, that brings the meaning to the word. So now we come to Chinese. Why didn't Chinese develop an alphabet instead of characters? <laughs> Okay. Ready? Six up C C six C C six up C C C C C C Sai six suck C C C C six C C C suck C. Or I'll say I am very good in Mandarin as well, so I'm gonna say it in Mandarin. Shu 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 So, the argument here is that Chinese people developed a system that was suitable for their language. And because Chinese has, we were just looking a few minutes ago at English, but Chinese has many, many, many more homophones. <laughs> so, what we would end up with is something like this. And this isn't very helpful, is it? Of course, if I had used the correct tones, you would have understood me perfectly. But the alphabet is not suitable for Chinese. And so your ancestors developed a system that was suitable for your language, which is a tonal language. And therefore, alphabets just don't work. Of course, you have pinyin. And pinyin can be learned, I suppose, and that, that, that would be a compromise. But Chinese characters are suitable for your language. Here's, uh, th these are all come from uh, Mandarin, so they don't work as well with Cantonese. But if you can imagine you're speaking Mandarin, all of these uh, characters are pronounced something like shi. So let's compare Chinese and Italian. And I hope you get the meaning. Chinese is a very, very untransparent system. 
Italian is a very, very transparent system. So these two languages are at two extreme extremities of a continuous scale of spelling transparency. Italian has relatively few sounds, so the alphabet suits it well. Chinese is made up of single syllables, and homophones are therefore relatively frequent. So the alphabet is not suitable for Chinese. English is in the middle. English is somewhere between Chinese and Italian. So, of course, we, we have to thank our, our ancestors for this. And, you know, we never think about this, but our ancestors have done so much for us to give us these systems that, that are logical, that make sense. So, each of the symbols can be understood in hundreds of different ways. And Chinese writing also relies on several hundred phonetic markers, as you know. And I will further specify how a given root can be pronounced. So, there's, as you can see, um, one example in graphic form. So, how clearly orthographic, orthographic is just a fancy name for spelling. Uh, how clearly the writing systems map onto the sound system. I tried to show this to you graphically. And the reason, um, so Chinese is very untransparent and you get more and more transparent. And you can see English is not so good, really, in terms of its transparency. Uh, the asterisk beside Japanese, of course, is because this is only for their new system, their hiragana and katakana, not for, of course, for the Chinese characters that they use. So could there be other, uh, some hidden logic reasons for our writing systems? And now I'd like to talk a little bit about the brain. How did our ancient ancestors use our brain's visual system? Because that's what spelling is. It's a visual symbols that have some sort of meaning. And how did they use this? And how did they understand about our brain? Well, of course, they didn't understand about our brain. But there's a part of our brain here that's sort of behind the ear on either side. And, well, before we get to that, um, if we think of this slide again, I, I really like this slide because I think it uh, probably best represents our, our first um, attempt to visually uh, portray something that would produce a sound. And as you can see here, I'm, I'm suggesting maybe the sound that came from this drawing is 13 deers. And now, since uh, in the last 15 or 20 years, there are machines called, I'm sure you're familiar with MRIs, but uh, fMRI, which is called Functional Magnetic Residence, Resonance, they can measure the blood flow in the brain by detecting iron in the brain. And so, what they do, they'll have someone go into an MRI, they will be reading, and then they can see where, which parts of the brain, there is blood flow. And the blood flow represents some activity going on in the brain. So, now they're um, quite sure where things are happening in the brain in order to understand what we do when we read. So all of this has come in the last 15 or 20 years. It's, it's we're at this amazing point in history where we understand. So how do we read? Take a look here. When we read, only four or five letters are in focus at one time. So that's what it kind of looks like. And our eyes do not move smoothly across the page. Up three or four times a second, so it's like not like this. 
and we, we notice only three or four words, seven or eight to, to the left, uh, I should say letters, to the right and seven or eight to the, to the left. So this is happening very, very quickly in the start and stop motion. Take a look at that. Isn't it amazing? Are you amazed at your to look at those two words? One is tiny, one is big, one is written in capital letters, one is written in some sort of very, very difficult looking script, but you can draw understanding from this very, very easily, basically. You might have looked a little bit longer at this one, but you still understood both of them to have the same meaning. This is an amazing uh, quality of the human brain that can, that can somehow recognize two things that are remarkably different, but you can almost instantly uh, derive meaning from those two things. So there's a strong similarity among all the world's writing systems with regard to the shapes and the strokes used. So our brain is very remarkably able to just derive meaning despite using different, remarkably different types of strokes. Small number of shapes and strokes, although it doesn't look like it when you look at these two words. And size is not important. Completely, you just completely ignored the fact that one was 8 point font and the other was 96 point font. You completely ignored that, but you could get meaning from this. Maybe this is something you haven't thought about before, but look at those two words. Isn't it amazing? You can derive meaning from those look so remarkably different. And I'm always amazed with Chinese characters because when I see people writing Chinese, I just think, how can you, how can you possibly understand it? Um, <laughs> correct? And you like mix, mix things up. And it's this remarkable ability of our brains to be so flexible. And maybe very quickly notice something. Very quick. Our brains are amazing. So here we have. They all mean the same to you. I should have got one that had a lot of strokes in it to make it more difficult. But so it works for Chinese. So what we understand about what's going on in the brain is uh, represented in the next two slides. This slide here shows that three things are going on in the brain. Our visual system is at the back, somewhere around here. This is the front, this is the back. So somewhere around here, this is where we recognize the print or the spelling, the orthography. And the sound system for the brain is up here. And this is the phonology. And the meaning system is at the front, because this is where the frontal lobes is where all the higher level critical thinking is going on. And if we think of this in terms of time, this here is 800 out of 1,000 1, would be one second. Okay, so if we look up here, so in less than half a second, in less than half a second, the spelling is understood by the brain. And at the same time, the meaning and the speech sounds come at this part of the brain and at this part of the brain, somewhere around the half second mark, half second here. So first of all, we 
the visual input comes in, we recognize the spelling, and then we can produce sound within half a second and meaning as well within half a second. So do we actually pronounce a word when we read? What do you think? Are we pronouncing it without moving our lips? Okay, read the following words. Everybody ready? You, you can say it out loud or you don't have to say it out loud. There's no, just... For each of those words, something different was happening in your brains. For the familiar words, in other words, number one and number three, you probably process them based on meaning. So this part of your brain, the meaning, you see the word, and the meaning is coming immediately to you. In the case of number two, for the unfamiliar words, especially number two, this is a completely unfamiliar word. Almost certainly you try to pronounce it and then you try to get some meaning from it. And you were unsuccessful. <laughs> For number four, you didn't recognize this as an English word, but it looks like an English word when you pronounce it. You said dying mom, and then you, that was the meaning part of your brain was working. And so, different process was happening. Also for number five, you pronounced it first because you didn't recognize it. Like number one and number three, you immediately recognize it. So meaning comes first, then pronunciation. Um, but for number five, you probably pronounced it and said, oh, that's carpet. Okay? So sound into meaning. I'm going to give you another sentence. Okay, what has happened in your brain? I took you back to when you were five, four, five years old. And you read this sentence just like a five-year-old. You tried to sound things out, and then you tried to derive meaning. So sound, and then meaning. This is how you read a sentence when you're a child. Did you enjoy going back to your childhood? <laughs> okay, uh, spelling in the brain. In general, there are two reading roots of spelling. A direct phonological route from spelling to sound, like a child reads, just what you did. That's the direct phonological route. First, translate the letters and convert them into sounds, pronunciation. Access the meaning of the sound. That's exactly what you did here. You sounded it out and tried to bring meaning. And I'm sure most of you found some meaning from this sentence. Here's another word at the bottom. This is a real English word, so what you were trying to do here is sound it out and then bring meaning to it. And maybe you were saying hegemony, or maybe you said hegemony. And then you said, okay, this looks familiar. What does this mean? It's what um, um, Vladimir Putin did this morning when uh, he sent his army into uh, the Ukraine.